You're listening to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast with Rebecca Larson. Of all of Henry VIII's queens, I believe Jane Seymour is the one that we know the least about. While her tenure as queen was longer than the six months that Anne of Cleves had, Anne also outlived her by two decades. Our guest today is Dr. Elizabeth Norton, who wrote a biography of Jane called Jane Seymour, Henry VIII's True Love. Now, this was about a decade ago, and Elizabeth has been continuing her research ever since. Elizabeth, welcome back. Hello. Thank you for inviting me on again, Rebecca. My Seasons of Queens was intended to be all non-Tudor queens, but you enticed me to discuss Jane further by telling me that maybe there's some new discoveries that we have to learn about. My first question is, what made you stick with Jane after all this time? Jane really gets a bad press. And if you're listening to this now, you may well think, you know, I don't like Jane or she's boring or she's, you know, the least interesting of Henry's wives, because that comes up time and again with Jane. And it's really unfair. Um, She is quite a shadowy figure. I'm working on trying to bring her out of the shadows more and I've continued to work with her. But I, I would absolutely say there is more to Jane than I think our kind of preconceptions about her allow. Um, She was a woman who attracted Henry VIII. I mean, you know, pulled him away from Anne Boleyn, I mean, which often accounts for her unpopularity. But there is more to this woman than sort of plain Jane Seymour or, you know, the woman who chooses her motto, bound to obey and serve. This is a, a real rounded and political woman. So I'm just always fascinated by Jane. And I think particularly the fact that she is seen as such a non-entity. We need to look more at her. I've suspected for a while, and I blame Alison Weir, (laughs) that Jane Seymour was pregnant at the time of Anne Boleyn's execution, which would also explain a lot of the events of the time. So hear me out for a second. A pregnant Jane meant the possibility of a male heir. And in order to have a legitimate male heir, he'd have to marry Jane before she gave birth. But he couldn't do that while he was married to Anne. What are your thoughts on a pregnancy before marriage? I mean, it's not at all impossible. Um, Of course, Anne Boleyn is pregnant before Henry marries her. And we know this from the date of their marriage and also the date when Elizabeth is born. So it's not at all impossible because, of course, The baby has to be born in wedlock. And although a child would be legitimate if you're married by the birth, by English law at the time, it's better if it's not widely known that the the woman is pregnant before the marriage um, for the legitimacy of the child. And of course, Henry already has two daughters who have dubious legitimacy, largely because of his own efforts to illegitimise them. It's a plausible theory Um, I have not seen any definitive evidence that Jane is pregnant. Um, We have a few sort of suggestions, perhaps. Um, Chapuy, the imperial ambassador, considers that Jane can't possibly be a virgin, having spent so long at Henry VIII's court, which is quite a rude comment, but does suggest that she's not this pure and sort of virginal woman that we we would sort of view her as. And there's a later account that implies that she's pregnant when Henry reconciles with Princess Mary in the summer, but it's quite a bit later. So I think the jury is out on it. I think it's not provable. If she was pregnant, it doesn't lead to a live birth and she doesn't give birth until 18 months later. Um, But it's an interesting theory and it, it would potentially account for the haste with which Henry rids himself of Anne. And marries Jane Seymour, because, of course, the couple are betrothed the day after Anne Boleyn is executed. And that is the reason why everybody who is an Anne Boleyn fan seems to hate Jane Seymour so much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's. I'm always reminded of um, Hamlet when, you know, Hen- when Hamlet's complaining about his mother's second marriage to his uncle. And he says, and I'm totally paraphrasing here, but it says, you know, the funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. You know, basically they've used the cold leftovers from the funeral to feed the wedding guests. It's that soon afterwards. And absolutely, Henry wastes no time 
in marrying Jane Seymour. They become formally betrothed the day after Anne's execution. They're clearly already engaged to be married before Anne Boleyn's death. Um, it is absolutely indecent haste, and it draws attention from contemporaries. There are um, accounts of people being arrested for mentioning the fact that, you know, the king was assured of the queen's grace before the other queen's death. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't look good. It's The betrothal is conducted with some secrecy. Um, Jane is brought to Chelsea to marry Henry. Um, and then they're not married for a few more weeks. And then it takes a little while for Jane to be presented as queen at court. It's a private marriage. There's no announcement in the marriage. Jane just then suddenly appears as queen. And I think that is due to the fact that it is indecent haste. Um, Henry needs a male heir. At that point in his life, he has two daughters. Um, one has already been declared illegitimate. The other one is about to be declared illegitimate. So he does need to marry and have an, a son as soon as possible. So that's one suggestion for his haste. But absolutely, I mean, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good on either part. I think in Jane's defence, she probably has very little say in the timescale for her wedding. And she does very much look as though she's sort of dragged along with this. But of course, she has agreed to marry the king. What I would say with Jane is she probably didn't realise that he was planning to execute Anne Boleyn. And I think this is always a point that's worth making, because she does get a lot of the blame for the fall of Anne Boleyn. And I think you know, she's clearly involved, but it's really unlikely that Jane thought that Henry would execute Anne. I mean, the whole of Europe was shocked by Anne's execution. And I suspect that Jane was. A lot of people didn't think Henry's marriage to Anne was valid. There are certainly grounds for it to be annulled quite easily. And I suspect that Jane, like Anne herself, thought that Anne would be sent to a nunnery and the marriage would be annulled. And I think a lot of the time people put the character of her brothers, Edward and Thomas, on Jane. And that's one of the things that I think we're most curious about is, is there any evidence to show her character or any similarity to her brothers, Edward and Thomas, who, are, of course, are well known at court? So Edward and Thomas, of course, are famous for their ambition. Um, the Seymours are quite a lowly family. They're gentry level but they are not movers and shakers in the Tudor Royal Court by any stretch of the imagination. She is much lower born than, say, Anne Boleyn, who, though ostensibly they're the same rank, really they're not. The Boleyns are much more prominent. So Edward and Thomas are incredibly ambitious, and we see that throughout their careers. Of course, Edward Seymour becomes Lord Protector under Jane's son. Jane is a little bit of an enigma. Um, and this is largely due to paucity of sources for her. We just don't have the material. We've got very little on her before she becomes queen. And during her time as queen, unfortunately, we've lost Chapuis' dispatches. We don't have them for most of her time as queen. And he is the source that gives us all the gossipy information about Anne Boleyn's time as queen. It would be really interesting to see what he had to say about Jane, but unfortunately, we don't have it. What? The traditional view of Jane is, and the view that um, she presents to the world, is that she's very meek, very demure, a contrast to Anne Boleyn. You know, she would never be found flirting with men in the Queen's apartments. She, of course, famously wears her gable hood, which is the hood we see in her portraits that looks like the roof of a house, whereas Anne Boleyn wears the more daring, more flattering French hood. So Jane very much presents herself as a contrast to Anne. Um, she chooses bound to obey and serve as her motto. and in many accounts, she comes across as quite sort of prim and proper, quite quiet. But I think there is definitely more to Jane. And particularly in my new research into her, it's very much sort of coming out, sort of delving into her character more. Um, you don't go from being simple Wiltshire maiden who can't get a husband. I mean, you know, she's in her late 20s, probably, and doesn't have a husband. Her family haven't managed to arrange a marriage for her. She's not particularly attractive. She doesn't have very much going for her. And you don't go from that to marrying the king without real steel in your character. And I think that really is an element that we should bring out with Jane's character. And we see flashes of it. Um, she's outspoken in her support for Princess Mary. She speaks up for some of the nunneries. She speaks up for the rebels in the Pilgrimage of Grace. There are moments where Jane asserts herself independently. And I think had she lived longer, we would absolutely have seen more of this. I really don't think that she is this meek and demure figure that she wants the world to see. Is there another queen consort in English history that you would compare her to? So Jane's quite a traditional consort. 
in a in many levels and i think that's deliberate as well because jane is almost certainly the lowest born woman ever to become queen of england and probably until prince william becomes king and we have until we have kate middleton as queen jane is really really far from the royal throne um i mean english women are rare as queen anyway in the tudor period but actually she's incredibly low born for a, a woman at court so i think there is a deliberate attempt to really portray her as a legitimate queen particularly given what has happened in henry's previous marriages he needs to show that this marriage is legitimate and that any children born to it are legitimate heirs and of course he may later change his mind he may later annul the marriage as he's done with anne boleyn but until that point he wants the world to see jane as a true queen so i think the best comparison is probably with henry's mother elizabeth of york she is as far as Henry is concerned, he's sort of model of the ideal queen. Um, she was very, very um, religious, um, raises her children, bears many children. Um, that's obviously a plus for Henry. Um, Elizabeth of York corresponds with foreign rulers. Um, she's quite demure, quite placid. She doesn't take too much of a role in um, the politics of the day. So I think if Henry is looking to link Jane to any previous queen, it would absolutely be with his mother, Elizabeth of York. And I think a lot of Jane's queenship, we can really see, we can compare it to the medieval English queens, perhaps not going as far back as sort of Eleanor of Aquitaine, where the English monarchs owned much of France. And obviously there was a much bigger role for a queen as regent or to have a political role. But in the 14th and 15th centuries, I think we can absolutely make comparisons between Jane and earlier medieval consorts. And I think that is largely deliberate. One of my favorite things about studying history is looking at the relationships between people. I want to talk a little bit. <laughs> this might be a weird question because this is just interesting to me to know. We know that when one queen consort left, the next would inherit what was theirs. As an example, their clothing, right? So what did Jane Seymour do with Anne Boleyn's clothing once she inherited it? Because I, I imagine she didn't want to be seen wearing the exact same thing her predecessor had been seen wearing. Yeah, absolutely. So um, clothes and jewellery get passed down through the queens. And we can see sometimes in portraits that queens very much do use their predecessors' wardrobes. Um, there's a famous miniature which is usually identified as Catherine Howard, but has recently by Franny Moyle been suggested to be Anne of Cleves. The reason we know it's one of Henry VIII's wives is because the woman in the picture is wearing Jane Seymour's necklace, which she's also depicted wearing. So we can see there the clothes and the jewellery being passed down. We know Anna of Denmark, the wife of James VI and I, wears Elizabeth I's dresses. So Jane will have inherited Anne's dresses and jewellery, almost certainly. Um, records are quite quiet on it. Um, it is, as you say, very unlikely that Jane would want to appear wearing Anne's, obviously Anne's clothes. Um, you know, she doesn't want to make that comparison. She doesn't wear the French hood because, of course, it's so associated with Anne. Um, and in fact, actually, we know from sort of brief accounts that Jane likes to dress quite richly. She wants to show herself as queen. However, I mean, it's really likely that Anne's clothes would have been adapted and made into new garments for Jane because of course the fabrics are hugely rich you know we've got cloth of gold we've got cloth of silver we've got rich black velvets we've got sables um so this this material is not going to be discarded so almost certainly Jane would have had it remodeled and changed into dresses for herself but we don't have the firm evidence on it unfortunately and that had to take some time to do they couldn't just do that overnight no absolutely not i mean i i my best guess on it is that it would effectively Anne's clothing would be treated as fabrics, you know, so that it would be handed over to the Queen's dresses and sort of slowly, you know, when the Queen needs a new dress, they might take some from one of Anne's older dresses and also Catherine of Aragon's dresses. Um, some of Catherine's jewels did make their way to Princess Mary, her daughter. But again, a lot of it gets passed down. We know that Anne takes some of Catherine's jewels, for example. Um, but yeah, it's going to take a while, but I suspect they're used as resources. And, you know, when the Queen needs some fabrics, they'll take them from the old dresses if they need to. And speaking of jewellery, on Twitter, somebody wanted to know, what was the deal with Jane demanding her ladies wear an expensive string of pearls? So Jane takes a real interest in what her maids wear. Um, and we know this particularly from the Lyle letters, um, which is a correspondence going to Calais between um, 
Lord and Lady Lyle and their English agents. And they are, um, Lord Lyle is a governor at Calais, which belongs to the English. Um, and Lord Lyle's stepdaughter joins, Anne Bassett joins Jane's household. And Jane takes a real interest in her appearance. She complains about Anne Bassett's French fashions, her French hoods, and she demands that she changes her wardrobe. So Jane takes a real interest in her maids. And what she's trying to do with the jewellery, with the pearls, with the dresses, is to present a very demure, very modest court. Because, I mean, Anne, we know, we all know Anne was innocent. Anne Boleyn was innocent of the charges against her. I and mean, I think that's, you know, that's uncontroversial to say that Anne did not have illicit sexual affairs with five men. But Anne's court was certainly flirtatious and there's dancing, there's singing, men visit the Queen's household. And we know that from Anne Boleyn's own account um, during her fall. Jane is very, very keen to avoid any suspicion of any sort of immoral behaviour. And I think that's really where the idea of dressing simply, dressing modestly comes from. And also, of course, Jane knows very well that she has come out of the Queen's household. And that Anne Boleyn has also come out of the Queen's household. And the Queen's household is where Henry meets women. Um, so she doesn't want her maids to look gorgeous to appear in all their finery and to attract her husband because she is not in a very secure position and she doesn't become secure until she finally becomes pregnant with Edward early in 1537. I often wonder about Jane. We hear that maybe she wasn't well educated because of her upbringing. Have you discovered anything in your research that would show us that Jane is smarter than what sh then what history has credited her for? Yeah, I mean, again, this is, to many extents, this is an example of sort of seeing the worst in Jane, I think. Um, you know, seeing her as boring, a bit common, a bit ill-educated. I mean, there's no real, to, there's no reason to su suggest that she hasn't had a reasonable level of education. We know that she owned books. In fact, Catherine Howard later owns a book that belonged to Jane. Um, she can clearly speak French to some extent um, because she's able to converse with Eustace Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, who speaks in French to her. Um, Henry rescues her from this conversation, which suggests that perhaps she's not entirely fluent, but she's certainly able to make some answers to Chapuis. Um, her brothers seem to be well educated, particularly Edward. Edward is quite a bit older than Jane. Um, he's the eldest survivor of the siblings, and there are a lot of Seymour siblings. Actually, this may well have attracted, helped to attract Jane to Henry, because actually um, they're a very fertile family. There are lots of sons in the Seymour family. But actually, although when Jane is growing up, it's not fashionable to educate women of her class at that stage. She's about a generation too early for that. And um, certainly boys would be educated. And, you know, it's, it was quite usual for girls to share their brother's lessons. So I think it's quite unfair on Jane. Was she a university scholar level? No, absolutely not. But by all accounts, you know, we know she can read. We know she can write. We know she speaks some French. Um, I think, again, I think it's, it's kind of slight level of trying to see the worst in Jane. Um, she probably has as good an education as, as another woman of her class. And particularly given the educational levels of her brother, she may actually be relatively well educated. I think when I compare her to Anne Boleyn, I think Anne Boleyn, we hear she was ed educated, sophisticated. She sang well. She could dance well. She could play instruments. She could do all of these things. We don't hear that about Jane, do we? We don't. We don't. And um, we don't know that she could sing or dance. Presumably she could. Um, she certainly she serves as a, um, a lady in waiting at court, which would suggest that she can sing and dance because that's really a requirement of the role. But we just don't have the direct evidence for Jane. Um, again, with education, you know, I've sort of just said that, you know, there is evidence that she is educated, but we don't have any specifics. We don't have any surviving books that belong to her. We don't have any surviving compositions or anything like that. Um, which is a real shame. But again, um, there is no evidence that she was in any way deficient as a court lady. She seems to have been a very successful court lady. She's certainly at court for quite a long period and, of course, attracts the king. Um, so, again, I think we can safely assume that she could sing and she could dance and she has been educated as a woman of her class would expect to be educated. Let's shift to religion a little bit, because I think this is the the most interesting part of the Seymour family to me is because Jane seems to be more Catholic focused, whereas her brothers were more 
reformists, maybe I'll call them. Where's that? Yeah. Where's that divide there? How did she end up that way? And they ended up the other way. Uh, so, see, I'm at quite an early stage in some sort of additional research into Jane, but I would slightly say I'm not so sure about that. And certainly I've written a biography of Jane and very much said, you know, Catholic, absolutely. But I, I am not so sure. Um, some of the people she's associating with, some of the sort of records of her religion in her lifetime that I've, I've uncovered, I think actually there, this is there's potential scope for some revision there, which I am busily looking at. Um, It's a difficult one. She's obviously, she dies in 1537. She's too early really for anyone in England to really be considered a Protestant by this stage. And this is a problem with Anne Boleyn, of course, you know, um, she looks quite Protestant in a lot of her piety, but also there are large areas of Anne Boleyn's religion that are very, very conservative. Um, she swears her innocence on the sacrament. A Protestant would not do that. Um, her al- almoner um, at Easter, um, the Easter before her death, preached the sermon talking about many aspects of the traditional church that Anne seemingly approves of. So I think, you know, it's too early to talk about Protestants for either Anne or Jane. What I would say is I think, again, we sort of try and create this dichotomy between Anne and Jane. So Anne is the Protestant queen, so Jane must be the Catholic queen. But actually, um, I'm not so sure about that. And I think there is certainly room for revision in Jane Seymour's religion. Do you think she persuaded Henry VIII to think more like he did before Anne came along? And maybe what I mean by that is, do you think Jane helped persuade Henry to consider Catholicism a little bit more after Anne Boleyn's death? I think Henry's religion is, I mean, Henry's religion is really, really interesting. He goes through stages where he's quite radical. Um, He questions the sacraments, some of the sacraments, questions purgatory. He, of course, allows the Bible to be printed in English. And then he starts to backtrack. And actually, by the end of Henry's reign, um, he's looking much more like a Catholic without the Pope than perhaps at earlier points in his reign. Henry is never a Protestant. Um, Martin Luther, of course, never approves of Henry VIII. In fact, um, he also refers to Jane Seymour as an enemy of the gospel, which sort of suggests she's more important than we're necessarily thinking about with Jane. I think both Henry and Jane, their religion is in a state of flux during their marriage, which is not at all surprising for the 1530s, because, of course, we've broken with Rome. Um, There's a lot of information coming in from Germany on early Protestantism, lots of changes, reform in the Catholic Church. So I think she's not necessarily pushing Henry one way or the other, but I think that both of them are in a state of flux with their religion, and they're both thinking about their religion, perhaps in a way that people hadn't done so much previously when there really is just one established church and one way of doing things. So I think it's a really interesting position. But I think, I don't think it's very helpful to think about Jane as the Catholic queen compared to Anne Boleyn's Protestant queen, because I think actually both women, there's, there's much more nuance to their religion. And I think it's so true that it was ever evolving. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that's the thing with Henry VIII. I mean, you know, if he had died before the 1530s, he'd be entirely conservative with his religion. If he died in the late 1530s, he's starting to look very, very radical. Um, he dies in the late 1540s and he's, again, quite conservative, albeit seriously schismatic. You know, he's broken away from the Pope, declared himself head of the church. But yeah, absolutely. I think there's so much change in the period. We had mentioned that there's not much documentation from Jane or even on Jane, how much is there currently in the archives that's written by Jane? Only a few impersonal letters, just an absolute handful. Um, birth announcements, primarily, um, where she, you know, where the Queen has given birth in lawful matrimony, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's nothing personal by Jane. She probably doesn't even um, draft these letters. These these letters are. You know, they're, they're written for her right. um, at best she signs them. So, no, we have nothing personal. In fact, we don't even have any definite evidence of her speech recorded. So she is very, very shadowy. Why do you think that is? Did they disappear? I mean, there had to have been some, right? Yeah, I mean, I think unlucky survivals. The Seymour family, of course, don't have an archive. 
Um, so, you know, it, that's where we would primarily expect to find letters, I suspect, you know, Jane writing to her mother, who survives all through her queenship, or Jane writing to her brothers. They don't survive. There's no archive. Um, and she's just not queen for very long. 18 months is a really short period. We don't actually have that many personal letters by Anne Boleyn. Um, most of them are formal letters. There are a few personal ones. There's a really nice early one to her father. Um, there are some other letters, but in general, they're not that many personal letters. With Anne, the reason we feel like we know Anne primarily, I think, is through Eustace Chapuis, uh, the imperial ambassador. And he, of course, hated Anne, um, absolutely loathed her. But he gives us a lot of information about her as a human being. And it's through a very negative slant. You know, he's not recording the good things Anne does. But it does really help to round her off and we can see her as a human. We don't have that with Jane. And and I think that's really where the loss happens. She's just incredibly shadowy. It's not that unusual. Elizabeth of York, um, you know, a generation before, we also don't really have personal letters. We can't see inside her head. So it's sadly not that uncommon with royal women in the period. And it's too bad. But there's still the possibility that some might show up. Absolutely. I would love to. I'd love to. I, that's so exciting to me. When things are found that have been lost for so many centuries, that is an exciting moment in history for us. Yeah, absolutely. One of the questions that I got on social media was somebody wondering if Jane Seymour had lived longer, would she have had some sort of control over her brothers, Edward and Thomas? It's a really good question. Um, undoubtedly so. In fact, if it, if Jane had lived and outlived Henry, she would have been regent. Um, no doubt about it. Um, Hen it was usual for the mother of a minor monarch to become regent. Totally standard. Um, we know that Henry's will in the 1540s gave the regency to Catherine Parr as Edward's stepmother. Undoubtedly, Jane would have achieved the regency. So we wouldn't have had protector Somerset. Edward Seymour very much would have had to kowtow to his sister. She would have been the chief Seymour, if you like. So I think she undoubtedly would have had interest, um, sorry, influence over them. She is clearly closer to her brothers Henry and Thomas than she is to Edward, who is quite a lot older than her, at least a decade older than her, probably a bit more. Um, so it would be interesting to see how the dynamic played out. He is, of course, the male head of the Seymour family. So he would always have a prominent role in his nephew's reign. But I think we would see Jane very much favouring her younger brothers, Henry and Thomas, over Edward the Elder. It's fascinating to consider the what ifs if one thing had changed. It is, it is. I mean, I certainly don't think that the brothers would have been executed had Jane been regent because they just wouldn't have had the need to vie for power because the power would be vested in their sister. Um, and as the uncles of the king, they would both get spoils. You know, they would both do well. But it's just Jane would add to the dynamic, I think, and mean that actually we don't get such sibling rivalry between the brothers. Mm. And you've mentioned her mother or their mother, Marjorie, um, a few times in this interview today. I'm so fascinated in Marjorie because I feel like there's a lot we don't know about her and she really needs a book. So can you do that for us? <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, Marjorie's fascinating. I mean, Marjorie is raised by Anne Boleyn's grandmother, of course, because that's her aunt. I mean, this is how closely interrelated the whole Tudor courts are. Um, Marjorie Wentworth, Jane's mother, is a first cousin of Anne Boleyn's mother, Elizabeth Howard. Um, so, you know, really interesting figure. And I'd love to know what she's doing and what she's thinking. And, um, you know, by all accounts, she seems to just sort of stay in the countryside, not come to court, not get involved. And Edge of the Sixth Court isn't even plunged into mourning when his grandmother dies. I'd love to know more about Marjorie. I think she's a really important element. And, yeah, I, I would love to. I, I suspect there's not enough for a book for her, unfortunately. And I'm not sure a publisher would take it. She's a bit unknown, but I would love to. I'd love to do some more on Marjorie. How much do you know about the time she was at court with Jane? With Marjorie? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, she's very shadowy. Um, again, as Jane is, really. Um, not a lot, really. Um, she'd been, she's widowed um, around the time Jane becomes queen. Um, we don't, we've got no sources really sort of talk, you know, looking at 
the relationship between Jane and Marjorie. It's probably through Marjorie, or at least through Marjorie's relatives, that Jane gets her foothold at court and that she's able to come to court. And it's probably the relationship with the family relationship with Anne Boleyn that brings Jane into Anne's household. But we really don't have anything on the relationship, particularly between mother and daughter, between Jane and Marjorie. Unfortunately, again, it's it's just one of these frustrations with Jane Seymour. I'd love to know more. Yeah. And there's mention of Marjorie being at Wolf Hall when it was already under her son Edwards. Yeah. Care. And there's also a mention of Marjorie at Sudley Castle. Yep. Yep. So, um, I mean, Marjorie is used as a chaperone for Jane Grey by Thomas Seymour um, after Catherine Parr dies, because, of course, he needs a female family rem- member. It's interesting that she pops up with Thomas Seymour, of course, because, you know, this is well into the rivalry between her two sons, Edward. Well, obviously, she has three surviving sons, but the two prominent sons, Edward and Thomas. Um, and it's interesting that she seems, at least on face value, to be sort of allying herself with Thomas there, because Thomas is usually presented as the bad guy in the sibling rivalry between the two brothers. So I think that's quite interesting that his mother goes to him, or at least when he summons her, she comes to him. And I find it interesting, even in her will, it almost seems like she's throwing a little shade at Edward because at this point, Thomas has already been executed. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's totally understandable. Um, The execution of Thomas Seymour was absolutely shocking because, I mean, it's, it's ordered by his brother. Um, and I mean, it's fratricide. Edward didn't have to kill Thomas. Um, and I mean, Edward makes a big show of, you know, not being involved. He sits out um, of the vote to attain the head, um, Edward for pardon. From, I'm sorry. So he sits out of the vote to attain um, Thomas for treason in Parliament, although he signs the death warrant. So, you know, he is he is clearly involved and does want Thomas dead. So. It, I mean, it was a serious business, ordering the execution of your brother. I mean, when we think about Elizabeth I and her reluctance to execute first the Duke of Norfolk, who's a distant cousin, and then Mary, Queen of Scots, who's also a dif- distant cousin, actually ordering the execution of your own brother is quite serious. Elizabeth herself refers to it in her letter to Mary I, her tide letter, um, you know, talking about how if Thomas had been allowed to speak to Protector Somerset, the execution never would have happened. So it is very serious. And I mean, it must have caused upset in the wider Seymour family. You can't go around executing your brother and then expect everything to be absolutely fine in your family. So I agree. I think, again, we're seeing a Marjorie who is perhaps looking more favorably at Thomas than at Edward. And how different the Seymour family changed from 1537, really at their height when Edward future Edward VI was born to just over a decade later when everything starts to go downhill. It seems like their rise to power at the beginning was so quick, so to speak, and then the fall happened so soon after. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the rise of the Seymours is undoubtedly based on Jane. I mean, Edward has been doing quite well at court before her marriage. Um, He's making a bit of a name for himself, but You just can't see the prominence of the Seymours as anything other than the product of their relationship to Jane and then also their relationship to Edward, Prince of Wales. Um, Their fall is surprising and sudden. And I think a lot of it is to do with the rivalry between the two brothers because it undoubtedly destabilises Edward Seymour's protectorship. Um, It also allows other figures to sort of grow in power. And I'm thinking particularly about John Dudley here. Um, But I think it is interesting. I think it... Enough attention isn't paid to the Seymour brothers for their meteoric rise because they go from being very, very minor gentry to being, you know, I mean, Edward Seymour is king in all but name. Fascinating story um, and absolutely one that leads to almost complete collapse in the late 1540s, 1550s. Dr. Elizabeth Norton, thank you so much for joining us today. And why don't you let everybody know where they can find your books? Well, thank you very much for inviting me along. It's been a real pleasure. Um, so you can find my books in all good booksellers, um, including online ones, of course. Some libraries have them as well. So my biography of Jane came out quite a long time ago. Um, my most recent book is actually on Tudor women, so The Hidden Lives of Tudor Women, which, again, you'll find on most good books, well, all good booksellers, actually. <laughs> thank you so much. We'll have you back when you have a little bit more research on Jane. Yeah, well, I'd love to. Absolutely. What a great time I always have chatting with Dr. Elizabeth Norton about Jane Seymour, and I truly look forward to her future uncoverings. Next month, I'll come to you with another queen, 
And we'll also be celebrating our sixth anniversary. That's right, six years. It's truly hard to believe that it's been six years, but I could not have done it without my listeners. But more importantly, my lovely patrons on Patreon. And for as little as $3 a month, you too can show your support. My new patrons this month, Lisa H. and Donna K., join the others in commercial-free access to the shows, as well as exclusive content and more. Want to show your support? Head over to Patreon today. Find the link in the show notes for this episode. And once again, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.